Kia ora koutou, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to the last day of school. Uh, the first half of 2020 has been dominated by one thing, COVID-19. As New Zealanders, we are all rightly proud of what we have achieved as a team of five million. We're the envy of much of the rest of the world and we enjoy freedoms that so many others don't. But it isn't scaremongering to say that that could all change and it all could all change very quickly. That is a statement of fact, and we only need to look at Australia to see that. We simply cannot afford to be complacent. Our best chance of preserving the gains that we have all made, of keeping the freedoms that we all now enjoy, is to stay ever vigilant. While it's also undeniable that today we politicians all head out onto the campaign trail, the fact is that the COVID-19 virus won't be taking six weeks off while we do that. As a government, we will continue to lead the COVID-19 response for as long as we are in office. And that includes using all of the tools at our disposal to ensure New Zealanders stay vigilant and prepared. And with that in mind, there are three things that I want to address with you today. First, as I alluded on Tuesday, we're going to begin a field trial of another tool in our COVID-19 toolbox, the Bluetooth-enabled COVID card contact tracing technology. As we've said many times before, effective contact tracing is a vital part of our response. While the manual process will remain the critical element of our contact tracing system, we do know that digital solutions can make our contact tracing faster and more effective. No single technology to solve contact tracing has been identified anywhere in the world. We're continuing to improve our existing tools like the COVID Tracer app, and I'll speak more about that in a moment, whilst at the same time continuing to explore other available technology options like the COVID card. Initial assessments have indicated that the COVID card works under controlled conditions and has the potential to make contact tracing faster. So we'll be carrying out further work um, over the next few months to see how it could be implemented in New Zealand. We will be undertaking a field trial in Rotorua and that could potentially involve 250 to 300 people and that will allow us to understand how the card works in a real world scenario whether it's compatible with our contact tracing system, and importantly, if the public would accept and use the cards if we were to roll them out more widely. A decision on whether to continue with the COVID card will be made later in the year. We do not anticipate that it would be made mandatory. The COVID card uh, won't store location data or track users. It simply blindly records the length and distance of the interaction with others who have cards who are up to five metres away. And information will be accessed if and only if the card user is a close contact of a confirmed COVID-19 case and contact tracing is required. In the meantime, we'll continue to develop and use the COVID Tracer app. I'm happy to report it now has 637,000 registered users. That's up 15,700 over the past week and just and 2,400 in the last day alone. QR codes are also increasing, currently up to 84,279. And the seven day average of the number of scans is also continuing to increase up to 19,591. And there have been 1 million 941,990 poster scans and 65,803 manual entries. That is proving to be a very popular function. So it's good to see the number of QR codes continuing to increase. Uh, my message to businesses who have stopped displaying their QR codes is please put them back and put them back in a prominent place. And the Ministry of Health will be getting in touch uh, with businesses and others to ensure that they are doing that. I have also been speaking with retail and hospitality associations as they continue to play a leadership role in this area. Finally, the use of face masks. The Ministry of Health has updated its advice on the use of masks by the public as part of our ongoing response 
to COVID-19. We've seen elsewhere that masks can play a role in helping us to reduce the spread of COVID-19 when worn by the public where there are cases of community transmission. I want to restate here, there are currently no cases of community transmission in New Zealand. The World Health Organization suggests that people should be prepared for the use of masks before the need to use them arises. So the ministry is now recommending that as part of our collective preparations for any future outbreak of COVID-19, households add sufficient masks for everybody normally resident in their household to their emergency supply kits. Just as we are prepared by having food and water set aside in the event of a natural disaster, we are encouraging New Zealanders to have a supply of masks set aside at home in the event of a further COVID-19 outbreak. These do not need to be medical grade masks. They could be reusable or the single use masks that people see online or in shops. Masks will be most useful when COVID-19 is present in the community and people are mingling in close proximity to each other, like at work or in social situations. Currently, at Alert Level 1, which is where we're at today, it is not necessary for the public to wear masks because there is no evidence of community transmission here in New Zealand. If we move to Alert Level 2, the public will be encouraged to wear masks in situations where physical distancing is not possible, such as on public transport or in shops. If there are further outbreaks of COVID-19, masks will be another important component in our strategy for containing the spread of the virus so that we can, if at all possible, avoid further lockdowns. This is, of course, in addition to strict physical distancing, hand hygiene, and most importantly, avoiding contact with others if you have COVID-19 related symptoms all things we encourage New Zealanders to continue to do today. I want to stress once again that this is about general preparedness. It's about being ready. It isn't about a cause for alarm. So we're asking the members of the public to view face masks as they view other pieces of their emergency supply kits, important tools that we can all use if we need to use them in the future. We will have further public awareness campaigns on this uh, over the coming weeks, and the Ministry of Health will be leading those efforts. I'll now hand over to the Director-General for the daily update uh, before we get into questions. Thank you, Minister. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, before I get on to the uh, daily update on numbers, just a couple of comments to uh, reflect on and reiterate what the Minister has said about masks. We know COVID-19 is spread from close contact with a person who already has the infection and masks are one tool in the toolbox to help spread the risk of, uh, to help reduce the risk of spread between people should COVID-19 be in the community. Our overall elimination strategy of course is still based on strong border protection, testing, contact tracing, uh, isolating people who are infected and of course, and the Minister's mentioned this, physical distancing. What we are wanting to do and what we are doing is adding masks to our overall toolbox as part of our um, ambition to avoid having to go up alert levels should they be required. We've got some good up-to-date, uh, easily uh, um, comprehensible information on our website about how to put on and take off a mask and I've even volunteered my services to do a Facebook video, so hopefully I can pass the test on doing that as well. We'll make that available. So masks are one part of our strategy, and what we are talking about here are non-medical grade masks or a reusable mask. There are some, there's a wide range of the latter that you can buy online or in stores, and we're just encouraging people to have one in their kit. We will be continuing to work with the health system to ensure there are medical grade masks available uh, right across the health sector. As you know, we have very good supplies and we have uh, improved and greatly strengthened our system for distributing those right out to the frontline staff should they be needed. And likewise, 
For some people who are at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19, our recommendation is they get uh, the higher quality medical or surgical grade masks, which they can do from pharmacies or online. Now turning to our daily case numbers. I can uh, report that there are no new cases of COVID-19 in the country today. So we're now 97 days since the last case of COVID-19 was acquired locally from an unknown source. One further case has considered to have, is considered to have recovered. So we have 23 active cases, all in managed isolation facility. None are receiving hospital level care. And our confirmed number of cases remains at 1,219. Yesterday, our labs processed 5,020 tests, and the total number of tests to date is therefore 482,929. And just two of those swabs yesterday were taken in managed isolation and quarantine facilities, so well over 4,500 were undertaken in the community, and it's encouraging to see that rise in testing numbers. I can't emphasise enough how important that testing is as part of our overall strategy and I want to thank those who have and will continue to come forward to be tested and the health professionals in the community who are taking the swabs and those in our labs who are processing them for their hard work. Finally on pop-up centres, we saw the pop-up centre in Queenstown uh, with over 1,050 people uh, showing up on Tuesday alone to be swabbed there and it pro proved to be very well used. Uh, it's provided the outcome of that testing provides a lot of reassurance for Queenstown locals and for the wider country about um, uh, there being no community transmission there. And I'm pleased to say that uh, there were 1,076 swabs in total taken. Uh, all but seven have now been processed and all have returned a negative result. It's not that those seven are being retested. In fact, they were just not labelled properly and they are now going through that process. There will be further pop-up centres in other parts of the country over the coming days and also over coming weeks just as part of our awareness raising, keeping the numbers up and particularly if we find areas that have got lower testing rates. So the four Auckland community testing centres were set up last week in Northcote, Henderson, Grafton and Whitty as part of a, an ongoing sustainable community testing model in the Auckland region. Uh, and there are now four new community mobile testing units in Auckland as well. And there will be an additional pop-up in South Auckland by the weekend that will be um, resourced by one of those mobile testing teams. Likewise, in Canterbury over the weekend, there will be an additional centre in Christchurch, and we will publicise the venue for that, um, which will be available on Saturday. Uh, the testing will be, we will let you know as soon as the venue is confirmed. In the Mid-Central District Health Board region, there will be two testing stations in Palmerston North on Friday. One is in the car park of the New World Pioneer and the other at an event at the Pacifica Community Centre at Bill Brown Park. Taranaki will have an additional pop-up testing clinic in New Plymouth on Friday from 1 to 3pm in the New World car park for any members of the public who want to be swabbed there, symptomatic or asymptomatic. So please do make use of these uh, centres. A test the testing helps us rule out community transmission of COVID-19 or if there is a case out in our community that has snuck through our very good border measures, we want to find it as soon as possible so we can act and maintain our very good position we've found ourselves in as a country. Thanks, Minister. Thank you. And if I can just wrap that up by uh, thanking those who are involved in setting up those pop-up testing stations around the country. Um, I acknowledge all of the work that's gone into those. And I do encourage New Zealanders, if you're offered a test, uh, please take the test. Now, happy to open up why, for questions. Why do, you, why do you turn on masks? Uh, look, the situation changes. The, the advice from the World Health Organisation has continued to evolve during this time. And uh, we're in a different situation now to what we were um, previously. Is it realistic that we would be wearing them at level two? Because looking at the alert level systems, um, the, the scenario that you outlined was that at level two we would have some community transmission. Looking at the, the risks, community transmission puts us back into lockdown. We would be encouraging people to use them uh, in public places where social, where the physical distancing, the social distancing, which we would be asking people to do uh, at alert level two, where that's not possible, we'd be encouraging them to use a mask so that we can keep public transport and other things like that operating. So what would prompt level two? Well, the, the criteria for escalation up the levels has not changed. So that would, that would be household transmission occurring. So why do people need to 
wear masks in public if it's contained within households. In order to, it's, a, it's an extra line of defence. So as we've said all along, this is about um, doing what we need to do um, to ensure that we are being as cautious as possible to avoid community transmission. The, the opposition is accusing you basically of fear-mongering. I, I utterly reject that. They put, out, they put out a press release yesterday, I don't know whether you saw Jerry Brownlee's comments, but um, he said that it doesn't add up. Why announce this now when there are a few cases? What do these guys know that they're not telling us? What do you know that you're not telling us? Uh, I would encourage Jerry Brownlee to swap the tinfoil hat for a face mask. It, it is a bit strange though that you know when we did have it spreading in, in the community, the advice was not to bother with masks, and, and, and now that we have eliminated it, now he's saying, hey, go out and, go out and get them, because the way the disease spreads isn't hasn't changed. Look, I think, you know, the, well, the reality is our understanding of the disease um, is changing all of the time. And so we get new information, we get uh, new experiences from what's happening around the rest of the world that we can draw on. So we can learn from others' experiences here to ensure that we are less likely to join them again and having to uh, have more dramatic controls. If this prompts people to rush out in the same way that we had the toilet paper crisis, is there actually the capacity, the stock available if people are going to go, ah, oh, I need to go get my face mask? So my understanding uh, as of yesterday was that there are around 12 million uh, masks available for in retail stock at the moment. And of course those retailers, as uh, you know, supply and demand uh, issues, they, they'll manage those supply and demand issues. It is important to note that these can be reusable masks. People can make their own masks. There are some good lessons on how to do that available on the internet. Um, fabric masks are good because people can reuse them over and over again and wash them in between uses. Um, and so uh, our, our advice is to, to have masks. And so uh, to have masks in your supply kit um, and uh, people, you know, doing it now means that people will have time to do that. Just on the COVID card, is it actually a card? It's a, my understanding um, is that it's a lanyard, something that it's a thing that you hang around your neck. So, so, it, so it is a card, or is it like a dongle? Well, I don't know. The, I haven't seen the actual physical shape of it, um, but I mean, as you know, with modern technology, you can make it whatever shape you want. Huh? In the new trial of the COVID card, what are you seeking to get out of that that the two previous trials didn't tell you? Um, as I've said, I think, you know, we'd, if we were going to roll this out much more widely, there would be a huge investment required in that. And so we do want to make sure that we're collecting all of the relevant information. One of the things that we want to test through the, the next trial um, is, is user response to that. So you know, are people continuing to use it? Um, does it provide uh, useful data? Um, do they find it useful? Uh, you know, those are the sorts of things that we want to be able to test through, and through the, the next field trial. The ends of COVID Tracer app. Um, uh, 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 my understanding is that it's some data from that has been used in contact tracing, even if the exposure notification hasn't gone out. Mm. Why hasn't that been publicised more? And can you tell me, or, or, or Dr. Bloomfield, could you tell us a little bit more about how that has been used? Yeah, I'll get Dr. Bloomfield to comment on exactly how it's been used. But I would just reiterate the the point that I've made every time we've talked about this: that the COVID Tracer app is a tool in the toolkit, and it helps us to speed things up. The more accurate people can be in recounting their contacts when, when they're interviewed, when, the, when there's a need to do so, the faster that process will be. And so if people are using the Tracer app regularly, they're adding in all of their entries into it, then obviously that's going to make the contact tracing manual process much faster and much more painless. Thanks, Minister. I'll just, I will take the opportunity yeah. to, first of all, just to again give a plug for, for the app, uh, because um, the key to successful contact tracing is being able to contact people in the first place and therefore simply downloading and registering with the app and giving us uh, at the Ministry of Health, and we're the only ones who have the data, up-to-date contact information is in itself incredibly helpful. Uh, thank you for the suggestion that you made about actually um, publicising the fact that the data some people have been collecting has been used and was used as part of our contact tracing efforts following up from the investigation we were doing on the person who flew to South Korea. It did, it proved valuable. Um, and uh, it, it proved the system worked. So even though we didn't push out a notification to people, there were some people who were part of the group who were followed up and traced who were then able to provide their information at, uh, at their, own, uh, their own choice to do that, and that helped us then track where they had been. So yes, the app has already proven its value. From a public health perspective, do you think that New Zealanders should get more sick leave? Uh, 
I think the important thing here, and the Minister is probably better to comment on this, the important thing here is that we don't want um, uh, sick leave to be a barrier to people staying home from work if they are unwell or staying home from anywhere. And as the Minister mentioned, a very important public health measure is that people do um, not expose others to a respiratory illness, which could be COVID-19, if they are unwell. Minister, you might want to comment yeah, on the sick leave issue. Yes, look, can I just acknowledge the uh, work of employers up and down the country? The feedback that we've had since the beginning of this exercise, you know, six months or so ago, is that employers are being as flexible as they possibly can be um, in encouraging their staff to stay home if they're sick. And I acknowledge that that's an extra cost for those businesses and for those employers, um, and their goodwill is very much appreciated on behalf of the team of five million. Uh, issues around uh, statutory sick leave entitlements, of course, are uh, issues for the campaign trail. And uh, those are questions that you can put to all of the political parties on the campaign trail. As you, the Labour spokesperson for health, do you think that New Zealanders should get more sick leave? Uh, I'm not going to be uh, making any party announcements uh, today and on this platform. Something on the campaign trail from you around that? Th that is uh, not a matter for me and it's not a matter for, for, day, for today. You're going to announce more sick leave? On that the is not a matter for me and it's not a matter for today. Joe. Support the idea of um, privately run isolation hotels, and can you just talk through what, what the risks and what the positives might be? And I'm interested in your comments on that too, Dr. Minister. Look, primarily that, that is a question for Megan Woods, of course, who is the minister responsible for managing these issues. What I would say from a health perspective, though, um, and also I can comment a little bit as Minister of Education on that, um, is that we do not want to do anything in that space that increases our overall risk profile. So we have worked really hard over the last three or four months to make sure that those MIQ facilities are managed in the you know, lowest risk way possible. And uh, of course, as soon as you expand, as soon as you bring more people in, you have to look at very, very carefully at how you would manage any you know, additional risk that goes with that. So the facilities that we've got now, we've got the risks down very, very low, um, and we're very confident and comfortable with that, and we're always looking at how we can do more to, you know, to, to remove any residual risk that exists there. As soon as you open that out, you create more risk. So I wouldn't support doing anything that increases our overall risk profile. Um, but with time, there are a variety of issues that we can carefully work our way through. Would you be worried, Dr Bloomfield, about any increased risk there might be with a private model? Not worried per se, but just to um, reiterate what the Minister said here, that we've worked um, and continue to work on a daily basis to minimise the risk within our managed isolation and quarantine facilities. It's absolutely fundamental to us maintaining our current position. So any developments, either changes to our current managed isolation and quarantine facility protocols or um, extension into private arrangements would have to fulfil very stringent uh, public health criteria and that's our role and we've seen that actually the value of those is we haven't had cases coming out of our managed isolation and quarantine yet into the community and we're absolutely um, are committed to keeping it that way. So we'll sick leave, should there be a provision for contractors to get sick uh, look, again, that's not a matter that I'm going to cover here today. Um, what do, you th do you think there's a reasonable chance of success in this trial? And do you think there's a reasonable chance that people will want to wear a dongle around their neck all the time? Look, I think the key thing about a trial is that you have to be genuinely open to it. And we are genuinely open to it. Do you, do, you, do you think people will want to wear a dongle around their neck all the time? Well, look, that, that's one of the things that you know we can test out through, the, through having a trial like this. A sizable investment, like you said, to, to put them out everywhere. Do you imagine that um, if if they're going to be used, they'll be distributed to people as the risk increases as we go up levels, or that it will be distributed to everyone, like in level one, and you'll set behaviour that way? Very hypothetical scenario at this point. The, the point of trialling it is to see what the technology is capable of, how it works, and how people respond to the technology. So those are all decisions that would that would flow from the, the findings of any trial. Money's gone into the trial so far, do you know? Uh, it, it's not a huge amount. I think around a million dollars, if I'm if I'm right. Yeah. Two hundred and fifty people, two hundred and fifty to three hundred. Do you think that's enough? I mean, right is reasonably big. Uh, look, the advice that I've had from the people who've designed the trial is that they, you know, they'll, they'll keep working on on you know the exact specification for the trial, um, but that you know that in in the order of that number would be about right for for a trial, obviously. How, how, how firm are you in the view that it wouldn't be mandatory? Uh, reasonably.
Yeah, look, the manual contact tracing system is still going to be the mainstay of what we do around contact tracing. And as I've always said, these, these tools, these extra tools, uh, bear in mind that th there are a lot of countries in a much worse position than us who are experimenting with these, you know, looking in uh, under a much greater sense of urgency to find the, the magic solution, and none of them have found one. So the, the most these tools, I think, will give us uh, are just that, they'll, they'll give us extra tools. And testing. Do you have a combined daily total for the testing rate at the, in the community and MIQ facilities? Uh, so just to just to re rehearse the numbers. So the total yesterday was five thousand and twenty, and of those, two hundred and ninety were from managed isolation and quarantine facilities. So the balance were uh, community tests. Oh, just in terms of your expectation, is the testing level reaching your expectation yet? In terms of community testing, obviously I'm very heartened by what we've seen over the last couple of days and I'd like to see that sustained. I do acknowledge that we do see a bit of a dip uh, in the weekends and no matter what we do it seems that that's the case. Um, but certainly I'm feeling much more comfortable with the level of testing that we're seeing at the moment. Um, I think we've still got a little bit uh, more work to do around testing at the border and I've been working very closely with uh, the Ministry, uh, with all those who are working at the border to get those numbers up, those are the people working at the border. Um, so we've still got some further work to do there, but I think the community testing is, is going well. I think the testing in MIQ is going well, as we would expect it to. The day three and the day 12 tests are, are about where we would expect them to be. Um, and so we'll keep pushing. Staff at the MIQ facilities yesterday, Minister Wood said she was interested in, in opening up testing for, for staff, security guards, cooks, everyone, if they wanted that, that sense of comfort and if we wanted that sense of comfort that they were possibly contracting the virus. So they can get that now, they absolutely can. People who are working at the border, who are in that higher risk group, they can be tested. Um, we <laughs> actually have this week a testing station located uh, all week at the Auckland airport, which of course is where one of the, you know, which is where we predominantly see that. Um, and so people are able to get tested there. That's good. If they don't have symptoms? Yes. And so they just have to ask, like if I, if I was a security guard at a hotel, I would just ask for a test. <coughs> why, why did Minister Woods not say that that was the case yesterday? Why did she understand it to be different? Uh, look, Me Megan Woods isn't, um, isn't overseeing this part of the, the process. Um, I am, um, and the Ministry is, so. She was under the impression that they couldn't get a test so easily. Um, yes, they can. Yeah. Did you manage to follow up at all around the mixed messages from some testing centres with the papers that they're still giving people telling them they need to self-isolate, even if they're not in that higher risk index? I'll ask the Director General to comment on that. Um, I know that I had some feedback yesterday um, uh, on uh, Healthline, you know, advice people were given from Healthline, and so one of the things I did was uh, get in touch with Healthline and we got some anonymised transcripts of the calls that they were receiving in terms of the advice that they were giving, and I can tell you, I read through five individual transcripts that names and personal details would be taken out. Every one of those people was encouraged to go and get a test and uh, was facilitated in order to be able to do that. So yeah. I am confident that Healthline are doing, because that's been one of the areas of concern, they are doing what we're asking them to do. Um, I'm not talking about the test part, I'm talking about the, them being told that they have to still, because remember it's changed, the self-isolation, you can't go back to work. So Yeah, I'll ask the Director-General to come Yeah, so that. for um, some weeks now, uh, the only people who have had to self-isolate are those who are, and it's a very small proportion, who are in that high index of suspicion who, who fulfil those criteria. Others, even if symptomatic, don't necessarily need to self-isolate until they get the results of the test. Uh, so saying... We're encouraging people not to go to work or not to expose others if they have symptoms. Yeah, sorry, just to get back to what I'm trying to say here. So there are community testing centres that are still giving out the original piece of paper that you would go home with that said you must self-isolate until you get a negative result, which is not the case anymore. Yes, so I, I haven't had any... Has the communication yeah. filtered down to the ground to say stop telling people to go home and self-isolate for three days or whatever? I, I very much hope so. I think our messaging has been very clear from the centre, but if there are examples, um, as we've found right through, this, uh, right through this effort over the last six months, there may well be examples in certain areas. We will follow them all up, but we can give that message out again. Right. Any insight into um, why the testing numbers have increased over the past two days? What's caused that? Well, I would hope that people are listening to what we're saying, which is if you're offered a test, please go and get your test. Uh, there has been a lot of publicity around it in recent days, um, and I think that's a, a very good thing, um, and I welcome that, and I welcome the increased public focus on testing. Would you have insight into how you're going to continue the momentum? Well, we'll keep talking about it. Um, I, obviously, one of the things that we um, have found is that the pop-up testing stations work, 
um, not having them in the same place all the time, moving them around actually works. Um, and so we'll continue to look at those. Last to, question over here. Are you here. going to go and buy you and your family masks? Um, I've got them on order, actually. Um, and I have some disposable ones that we could use in the meantime if there was uh, a need for us to do so. Take a quick question on survival screening, self-testing. Um, which is a story that came up today, just while you're both here. Yeah, look, I haven't had a chance to look at that in great detail, but I'm... Um, are, you, are you able to understand? Why is the government not prioritising cervical cancer self-screening when doctors are actually warning now that women will die? Look, um, I haven't had a chance to look at that in great depth. Um, I don't know whether the Director-General wants to make a comment on that. I'm happy to come back to you on that, though. Can, can hang on, hang on, just, we'll just get that answer. So right. just two comments to make, and uh, um, we're working with the clinicians, uh, including uh, Bev Lawton, who I know well, on this issue. Uh, two comments I'd like to make. First of all, um, not I don't want to undermine, and neither I know does Bev, the current uh, cervical screening program. And it is very important that women, all women, are facilitated to and take up the offer to get a regular cervical smear under the existing program. It has been incredibly successful in reducing deaths and morbidity from cervical cancer. And the only way it will continue to do so is if women um, keep getting a regular smear. On HPV-based screening, there is clearly an intention to move to an HPV-based screening, including the option of women um, using a self-administered swab. And uh, Bev Lawton and others have done a, 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 a study to show that there's high acceptability of that, which is very encouraging. So saying, the important thing for any screening program is that uh, women, or in the case of bowel screening, both women and men take up the offer to be screened. And I strongly encourage all women to continue as part of the extant program while we go through the work that needs to be done, including updating the information system, which needs to be upgraded as a prerequisite for moving to HPV-based screening. Okay. I'm going, to, I'm going to wrap things up now. Um, this is the last day of Parliament sitting and I have uh, questions that I have to go and prepare to answer in the House. Um, I do want to thank you all for your uh, company over the last one month and three days, not that I've been counting. Uh, from here on, uh, the Director-General will be doing a weekly briefing at the Ministry of Health. Uh, he will not be on the campaign trail, obviously. Um, I will be available whilst on the campaign trail to continue to answer your questions, uh, and we'll look to schedule something probably weekly um, to make sure that I can keep you updated on the work that the government uh, is doing around COVID-19. So I'll see you on the campaign trail, everybody. Thank you.